you'll allow me to share a personal moment um, with you. I am intensely proud of my little college at the moment uh, and for the power that we've generated together to put this, put this thing in, in the works. And also the courage that it takes to launch a project of this scale with such a small staff and um, frankly some fairly limited resources. As you know, this week represents uh, the commencement of a year-long series of events called Community Works Artist as Social Agent and is meant to illustrate and reinforce the huge role that artists and designers play in city and community making. This year uh, involves having Stephen Vetter and residents here at CIA, CIA this week for the whole week, a number of new experimental and socially engaged classes that you'll probably hear more about, exhibitions, artist talks, symposia, and et cetera, and I hope to see you all many more times over the course uh, of this extended project. So uh, being small, as I said, and I always prefer the word scrappy to small, uh, describing CIA, um, none of this would have been possible without the help of many, many people here. In that regard, I'd like to personally and sincerely thank the CIA steering committee that's been working for well over a year on this extended project and the chair of that group, Bruce Jachewski. I would like to extend my undying appreciation to my office staff, Anna Cottis, Lynn Flournoy, and Andrea Cahoot. Barbara Kira, the Academic Director of Cores and Connections, which is the academic vision of the school at this point, has been absolutely tireless in her dedication to this important work. And the entire advancement and marketing teams have been on board from day one. I'd also like to extend a personal thanks to my boss and mentor, uh, Grafton Nunes. Since day one, Grafton's been exceedingly supportive of all of my wacky ideas. Well, most of them in any case. And this year-long series of events uh, is probably the largest one that we put together uh, as a team. So thank you, Grafton. And I'd also like to acknowledge the help and wisdom of Mark Chupp at the, in the Center of Urban Poverty and Community Development at Case Western. You're a valuable colleague uh, in our shared work, Mark. And last but certainly not least, we want to take a moment to thank the residents of Cuyahoga County for supporting this college through a public grant from the Cuyahoga Arts and Culture. Funding from Cuyahoga Arts and Culture is different from our other funders because Cuyahoga County residents voted in 2006 to create this agency to fund the amazing arts and culture in our community with local tax dollars. So thank all of you for that support. Just being here now, this is my fourth academic year. The arts and culture in Cleveland are indeed amazing. So the way the formal work is, is sort of like this. After a brief, uh, very short introduction of the panelists, Stephen Vetter will talk uh, a bit about the topic at hand, the three forms of social capital. Then each of our panelists have been asked to share their thoughts with us about, for about five minutes, either in response to Steve's comments or their own thoughts on the topic. And then hopefully and probably we'll have a, a bit of time later on for some conversation with the entire group. So I'll introduce the panelists now, uh, starting at stage left, or they call it house right, uh, is my dear friend Sai Sambandit. Um, Sai, Sai comes from a family of immigrants who came to this country when he was a child. Uh, on their journey here, his family of six went through three refugee camps and finally settled in a small community in the northwest corner of Ohio. And as I say, Sai's a dear friend of mine has shared with me that uh, a lot of his work today is a result of people who have helped him out along the way. Sai is now a practicing architect and faculty member uh, working in architecture as a vehicle to explore the world and its dynamic relationship between people, cultures, systems, settlement, and displacement. And he works, does big projects with the UN, by the way. It is in this area of boundaries and this place where opposites meet that he tests the idea that design and art is not a political haven, not a world apart from the world, but a powerful generator for social change. Next, Tom Shorgel is president and CEO of the Community Partnership for Arts and Culture. And we all know CPAC is a nonprofit arts and culture service organization with core skills in public policy, business development, and research. 
CPAC's work in public policy led to a 2006 dedicated arts and culture local option tax generating $15 million annually. And CPAC uh, provides business training and support to individual artists. Its Creative Workforce Fellowship Program has annually awarded $20,000 $20, individual artist fellowships in all uh, disciplines. And I note that a lot of what we do here at CIA would be impossible without your help, Tom, so thank you. Barbie, Barb, Bobby uh, Richtel is the executive director of the Campus District Incorporated. In this role, Bobby leads the redevelopment efforts in the arts, medical, and education district of downtown Cleveland. The campus district includes Cleveland State University, Cuyahoga, uh, Cuyahoga Community College, St. Vince, Vincent Charity Medical Center, and the Superior Arts Live Work District. Through collaboration with the anchor institutions, residents, and other stakeholders, she carries out community planning, neighborhood marketing, and branding and physical development of the area. So thank you for being here, Bobby. Mark Chupp is assistant professor and chair of the master's concentration in community practice for social change at the Jack Joseph and Morton Mandel School of Applied Social Sciences of Case Western University. He also directs the East Cleveland Partnership, a multi-institutional initiative to support the revitalization of East Cleveland. His work over the years has focused on community building and intergroup conflict transformation. Mark is an international consultant and trainer in civic engagement, appreciative inquiry, and conflict transformation. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for the radio show yesterday, by the way. And finally, our keynote speaker, Stephen Vetter. Steve has served as president and CEO of Partners of the Americas since 2008. With over 35 years of experience in international and domestic development, Steve offers a rich background in international voluntary service, grassroots community leadership, and developing public-private partnerships to reduce poverty and improve the economic and social development of disadvantaged populations. He's been especially active in supporting the long-term partnerships between universities, this is why he's here, local volunteer organizations and development programs, and is leading the Partners of the Americas uh, partnership with the Department of State and NAFSA to implement President Obama's 100 Strong initiative in the Americas. Steve is an active Woodrow Wilson Fellow and has an MA in Economics from Ohio University, an Ohio boy, uh, where he also earned his undergraduate BA uh, degree in Economics. And I also wanted to mention uh, briefly that one of our students following a conversation with Steve earlier this week uh, said, and I'm quoting this, now I know what my art could be doing. And that, my friends, is what this is all about. So on that note, I'm very honored to present Dr. Uh, Mr. Steve Vetter. Boy, what a pleasure it is to be here at Cleveland uh, Institute of Art. And I have to tell you, um, I'm almost ready to give the floor back to the other speakers here. When I saw Tom and Size and Bobby and, and uh, Tom's uh, remarks, bios, I left it the chance to really come to Cleveland because it appeared that what they've been working on is something that in the field of international development we had come to realize as well. And that is when you're looking at issues of revitalizing communities, when you're looking at addressing the issues of poverty, you can't do it alone. And you need to bring a mix of dynamic players with a certain kind of talent and energy to make any difference at all. And one of the things I had discovered over many years of working in community development, both as a grant maker and also implementing programs, was that artists and artist institutions bring a special flavor that if you don't bring it to the table, that loaf of bread just won't rise. And so we'll be able to talk a little bit about that. By way of background, the backstory um, on this Ohio boy is I grew up and my family is from Portsmouth, Ohio. 
which is one of the poorer communities uh, in Ohio. In 1984, Life, Life Magazine had a feature, The Poorest Children in America. And I took one look at it and I go, that's Ray Shear's children, and that's 104 4th Street. I opened it up and that was Ray Shear's children. And I went, oh my God, this is crushing. And that question of, well, what do you do and how do you engage these issues uh, is one that has never left me. Also, when you're out of a poor community and, and you travel up and down the Ohio River to Pittsburgh and Cincinnati and you see the abundant wealth and you go, what happened to my community? And then when we would go vertical to Columbus and, and Cleveland, we asked this even more so. And so that question of, well, what explains the wealth and vitality of a community and what explains the inability to accumulate that wealth has been something that has followed me all of my life. And what I want to do today is just share a few of those lessons learned. Now, Partners of the Americas um, grew out of John Kennedy's vision for bringing wealth to the Americas. It was going to be the Marshall Plan for Latin America, the Alliance for Progress. It only lasted three years, and after his death, everyone battled over whether it was good or bad, and they tore it apart. And the only thing that was left was a very small piece of a nonprofit they had created inside it called Partners of the Alliance, which became Partners of the Americas. And we sustained ourselves over 50 years by the simple mission that is found in our name, Partners of the Americas. The idea that we could work in partnership somehow, some way, was a strong enough of a guiding light simply because we've been able to maintain fidelity to that vision. Um, our mission is to connect people and organizations in, uh, across borders to serve and change lives through lasting partnerships <coughs> is the actual language. Our tagline is simply this, connect, serve, and change lives. And we found that it was the easy, reduced way of understanding three important elements. The first one is, who do you connect with? How connected are you? When and where are you connecting to do what? And we had a lot of misinformed connections with people who really did not want to serve, did not have the impulse or the capacity to serve, and were there for international travel, resume building, or whatever other reason other than serving. And whenever we saw that, there was trouble. That we, we found the true servant leader, the humble one, who was just in there slogging away. There were tremendous results, and lives were changed. The other thing we found, that um, you need a network, both internationally and locally, of multiple players. The day of the Lone Ranger, the Joan of Arc, the Lawrence of Arabia, the lone individual doing this alone, we're too big, it's too complex, it's moving too fast. And so the question is, how do you bring together the right elements to make something happen? And when we look at the statistics on poverty, we know we're not doing it right and that something is missing. And so this willingness to come back together and address this again. I can tell you this, it is not sustainable to have a poverty level at 54% without going into something that looks like El Salvador or Guatemala. And in Baltimore, in Philadelphia, in Richmond, in Washington, D.C., you name it, the fears are rising that we just don't know how to solve it and we've got to come back and get it under our control. Washington's just rebuilding itself now after the Martin Luther King riots of 50 years ago. Just now. Everything has been tried and finally we've got the mix right. So this is serious time for some serious action. This is the envision uh, as a growing, interconnected, global neighborhood where people and organizations reach their fullest potential through long-lasting partnerships. And in it, we have chapters of volunteers. 
that draw a lot of those volunteers out of colleges and universities. We work a lot with government agencies. We manage some development programs. We're combating child labor in Panama and Ecuador. We are developed a youth employment through sports program in 14 other countries. And so we do programs and we manage volunteers. We do a lot of corporate social responsibility and have a lot of corporate support. Our heart and soul and ethos is around nonprofit volunteers working in local organizations. And it used to be we only looked at those volunteers in our chapters. But when we stepped back during our 50th anniversary and looked at who's performing, where are the results, uh, next slide. We used to have just this bilateral relationship between Wisconsin and Nicaragua, between Ohio and Pará, uh, Brazil, between New York and Panama, and just a whole series of these 20s. Next slide. <clears throat> but what we found was they wanted to learn from each other. If someone knew how to do one thing in another place, it had been discouraged. We didn't want to dilute or weaken the network. And when I looked at it, I go, if you hire me, I will blow that up. OK? I'm looking for fusion, nuclear fusion, of a learning network that bring people together to collaborate. This thing of isolating these organizations just is not going to weak. And indeed, we were in a weakened position. Next slide. <coughs> and this is where we got in to realize what the power of three was. And what we found that in any of the areas where we were trying to work or make a dent, universities were the sourcing of a lot of our volunteers, both staff and faculty, or faculty and students. Our volunteer chapters were an interesting mix of highly connected, rich in social capital people who love to connect each other. And then in our program areas, we would bring these together, and then we would go to the donors, the local NGOs and businesses, the uh, community associations, and then pull it together. But it was that triad there between universities, chapters, and the actual programs is where you really saw the kinetic energy come forth. Now, what's interesting about that is that oftentimes in the universities, it was arts groups and the art faculties. But in my life, as an economist and all, they would go, what are you doing with artists? What do they know about this? It was always the most undervalued part of this. Next slide. I want to go quickly into why the social capital is so important. And the civil society discussions you'll hear a lot about, and I don't know if, you're in, if that's in local currency here, but many people gave up of talking about democracy simply because we had a one-size-fits-all and many people around the world just gave up on it and said, what is this civil society? Because here's what happened. Next slide. Um, government, the market, and the nonprofit or non-government, that Venn diagram really caught and captured what many people thought should be the right elements of people coming together. The second part of it, was we had to return to the work of Adam Smith and look at the three forms of capital. Almost all economists we were working with were always talking about working investment capital. It's the only thing they wanted to talk about. And we would go back and go, look, it begins this way. All wealth is created. It begins with human, individual talent and capital that is formatively developed in schools for the most part. Human capital, intellectual capital, explains so much of the explosion in the wealth sector, the digital sector, the manufacturing sectors. But the thing about intellectual capital is it can be alone and never built out beyond that. This is where social capital comes in. You've got to build a network that is highly interconnected or that product you're making doesn't go anywhere. And so the high network, high trust communities oftentimes are where you see change. 
trust is an interesting element in social network capital. In, in this quick slide, this also reveals the way it worked internationally and maybe here. In phase one, the 1940s to 80s, all change was assumed to be governments to governments. They had the monopoly over change, and that was really it. There were fragile levels of uh, nonprofit, non-government organizations in Latin America, but for the most part, if you talked about working with them, you were suspect. They were anomalies for the most part. Phase two came uh, with Ronald Reagan and the role of the market, and all of a sudden the market was going to solve everything that the government could not. The market was all intelligent, it was brilliant, until we looked at what happened in Russia, where gangster capitalism took over, and everyone asked, where is the restraining force here? It's certainly not in government, what's missing in this formulation? And that's where I think the non-government civil society discussion really came forward. You know, if you look back at the old news reports, you never heard NGO or nonprofit, all right? It was really the late 80s that started coming on, 90s it got stronger, and now they are a trusted source of information, and that's where you hear. In Cleveland, this is what you have here, basically, at the table. Nonprofit universities, for the most part, nonprofit organizations working. What one of the really difficult things for me of working in a nonprofit was when my three sons came to me and they go, Dad, they have career day at the, high, at the high school, and it'd be really great if you could be a speaker and tell them what you do. And I go, I'd be honored. They go, but you can't tell them you work for a nonprofit. <laughs> I go, that's what I do. And they go, you can't do it. Guy, kids aren't into non. They're not Tell them what you do. Just don't say non. I go, but it's what I do. So I go to the panel and the, an admiral from the Navy shows up in his white uniform with all of his medals and battle ribbons. A captain from Delta Airlines shows up in the same uniform almost. And there I am in a crew neck sweater and I go, this is not going to be good. <laughs> but at the last minute I had an idea and I go, I'm Steve Vetter and I am the president of a social profit agency. We seek to create the social wealth that brings people together in communities to solve problems. My sons looked at me and they go, nice dad. <laughs> and I went, oh. But I think when you hear from the other spo the speakers here, you'll understand the power of this social wealth. And it's what's lacking. Next slide. Uh, this quote is very important to me. It took me many years to fully understand it. And Uma Viswanathan joined us in Colombia, Barranquilla, Colombia, about in 2012, and we'd organized a world summit on international youth voluntary service. We thought we'd get 200 kids from around the hemisphere. We had 950 show up, desperate to learn how to serve and produce real results in voluntary service, create NGOs. We go, whoa. Uma went to Haiti after the earthquake and to teach yoga. And I go, yoga? Yoga? She says, it's about to deal with the stress of their lives to develop the clarity they need to get from day to day. And when you're a victim, you have to find a way to empower yourself. And so my purpose was to show them if they volunteered to work together, they would become empowered. And the only way I could get that message to them were through very simple yoga classes in their poor neighborhoods. And I go, once again, there I am surprised how everyone has something to bring to this equation. And the quote she gave me is one that's in my book that just came out. Next slide. And then the final piece of this is the other part I found that whenever you see a community coming together, a highly functional, non-conflicted, willing to work together to protect members. It's because there's something I've come to call the guiding coalition. There are these representatives of different organizations that come together. Many times they're in competition, 
but they raise their sights that next step up and they agree to work together and look for ways to inform and inspire the community. In Spanish, there's this wonderful phrase that explains so much of this, poder convocatoria. It's the power to convene. And many times, if you invite someone, she won't come. You invite someone, he won't come. But you know if you go to Barbara, you'll all come. And so they look for this special talent to convene and pull together people to collaborate. And what again, let me end where I began. For some reason, it's the artist and the artist's temperament that tends to do this better and more comfortably. And through their discipline to their craft, the mastery of their craft, their organization, they tend to capture the imagination and they also tend to be non-political and non-ideological. And so they have this power to convene. So when Chris um, invited me to Cleveland to see the role of the Cleveland Institute of Art, I go, I really want to understand how you do this. Because what had happened to me, whether I was in Jamaica or Columbia, I would find the lone artist doing this. They would feed out of the Institute of Cultural Affairs or something. But I'd never seen an art institute play this kind of a leadership role just simply to convene and explore together how we as a community are going to solve a problem. Zip it up, Steve. Take it back over. Who's our next speaker? Thanks, Steve. Yeah. As far as <laughs> side, uh, okay. Um, I guess I have five minutes. Uh, <laughs> um, my, you know, I guess my journey here is um, a little bit more windy and um, complicated, but. I was one of those uh, artists and designers that been wanting to, just been wanting to do projects on their own. And um, not until really my involvement with the underserved community and the refugee communities um, overseas that um, I lived in Darfur for, for uh, three years and not until that life-changing moment did I realize that this thing is just too, too big and I need to figure out how to, um, leverage my training as a designer and a artist. And so I, after that I, I, I you know, was searching for um, a medium to, to kind of uh, help the community, but at the same time leverage my, my ability and my training. And so um, one path was leading to the CIA uh, the other is parallel, which is um, working with the United Nation, and uh, and and at the same time being in Cleveland. I actually um, never thought I would be in Cleveland for this long, but uh, I fell in love with it, and um, you know, and wanted to actually have a voice in the development of the city and and really the people. And uh, and so I've been working with um, the the underserved community for for several years now, just in. Um, in a small group and fell in love with, with, with the people. And so um, my role at, here at the Institute, um, currently I'm, I'm teaching a, a, a class that's working with the 17 homeless shelters, um, getting the, the students involved with the, um, the people and the organizations. Um, currently we're just research right now, but beginning of next week we're actually gonna go start um, engaging and going out on site to, to meet the the, sh the shelter organizations and the, the, the people they serve. And so, um, and it, this is a, just an exciting time because of uh, all the development in Cleveland itself, but at the same time, the awareness of, of, um, the, awareness of the students um, as well as the, the artistic community of how do we um, bring to, to, what we bring to the table uh, with other disciplines and how we can um, support the, the organization that's serving the community. Um, in, in that sense, uh, you know, that's, that's where I'm at right now and I'm hoping to be able to uh, translate to the students, help guide the students to be able to, to, be able to balance both, both professional life and, and the life that 
serves the community at the same time, um, having them recognize that it's not one or the other, it could be really both. So that being said. Right, thanks. Um, well, we still have some time left. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about establishing a relationship of trust with those communities and how, how you build that and how it's maintained. Uh, it's actually pretty easy. Um, it's just you go and listen. You, know, you, you, you go and, and listen and you share stories and you get to know people. And, um, and uh, art at that point becomes tertiary. It, and, and then once you really recognize and understand the people and, and your friends at that point, um, then you overlay that information into your training and um, your background and see what you can, um, uh, what you can um, create to, to bring to the table to help out. Great. Thank you, Sai. Sure. Tom, could you share some of your thoughts with us? Sure. How many visual artists are in the room? How many are painters? How many are sculptors? How many are printmakers? Um, I want to get to the, the, the power to convene, because I think that's really important in terms of the community partnership for arts and culture. Uh, I was recruited by the George Gunn and the Cleveland Foundation in 1997 to come to Cleveland and develop a strategic plan that would link the arts and cultural sector to other sectors in the community. And I remember um, the first time I met with staff members from both uh, foundations, and they had developed a steering committee, or the beginnings of a steering committee for this three-year project. And I you know, went down through it, and I didn't know any of the people on there, but their titles were next to it. And I, and I found that there was um, a lot of the same sort of folks that are on the boards of all the same sort of not-for-profit organizations. Um, so I did a little research before I came to Cleveland, and I realized that Cleveland uh, was one of the most important communities in the United States when it came to organized labor, and still was. And so I said, well, I don't see anybody from organized labor on here. The room got very quiet. <laughs> and one of the folks in the room looked at me and said, well, um, yeah, uh, so? And I said, well, number one, uh, people who belong to organized labor and unions do consume the arts. And I said, the second thing is one of the things that I've been told that, this, that, that Cleveland and Cuyahoga County would like to achieve is local public sector funding for the arts. And I said, 250,000 households is a pretty big voting block. And it's important that we have uh, that knowledge that organized labor can bring to the table. I went down through and I said, I don't see anybody from the religious community. Why the religious community? And I said, because there's a lot of people who go to church and we need to bring that particular view. I said, who are the artists on this steering committee? Well, you know, we have the head of some major arts organizations. And I said, well, that's good. I mean, it's good to have those folks on it, but you also need to have individuals from small and medium and community-based uh, neighborhood organizations, as well as individual artists. Anyhow, uh, what started to come out of that was an approach, and I'm only gonna talk about the first piece of how this <coughs> arts and cultural plan was evolved. Uh, we developed a process where we had 42 community dialogues around the region. It was a seven county regional arts and cultural plan. And so we would contact people either in Cleveland neighborhoods, suburbs of Cuyahoga County, or other uh, uh, places within the other, other counties, clearly individual artists and arts and cultural organizations. But we also wanted to get a hold of some of the local politicians. And we also wanted to talk to people who were working in different sectors. Because we wanted to attract to these community dialogues a very broad cross-section of individuals and to get from their point of view the value of arts. And so we would go into a community and we'd say, here's what we want to try to do. 
we want to develop a plan that has goals. We described what a goal was. We want that those goals to have objectives. We described what objectives were. And we want those objectives to have actions or strategies. And I said, that's all we really want, but we want your mailing list of your particular sphere of influence, whether it's organized labor, religion, business, education, uh, will you help us? And to, uh, to most people, they said, yeah, we'll, we'll do that. We also make sure that the minority communities were going to be represented at these community dialogues. And so I would meet with leaders from the African American community, uh, the Native American community, the Asian community, and the Hispanic Latino community. And the first thing that I would ask them, because I facilitated these, uh, these community dialogues, I said, am I the right person to facilitate these dialogues? Um, the African American community said, you're a nice guy, but no. Uh, we, we, can, we can recommend a number of people. The Latino and Hispanic community said, do you speak Spanish? And I said, no. And they said, well, you're not the right guy uh, to, to facilitate that. The Asian American community said, yeah, why wouldn't you be the right guy? And the Native American community said, well, we've had a lot of right guys uh, in our history in America that really never delivered. And if you know anything about Native American history, it, it's true. But we were working with people on their terms. One of the things I would say when we went into a neighborhood, what's the best bakery in this neighborhood? Because that's the desserts or snacks that we want to buy from the bakery in your neighborhood or your community. So people felt that there was ownership. I would go in, I would say, this is not about my vision of arts and culture. This is not how I define arts and culture. It's about how you define arts and culture. So as we started these community dialogues focused on goals, we would hear things like, well, arts education is important. And uh, you know, we certainly didn't discount that. But we would say, well, why do you think arts education is important? You know, give us some examples. And we'd get those examples. And then we would go back out, and that's when we would do our quantitative research. We would begin to determine, is what these groups believe is of value does it, does it exist and is it measurable? Because we're going to have to develop strategies and actions. So as we did that, we came up with four goals. And those goals were education, uh, they were partnership in terms of the community, different sectors. Uh, it was also uh, the development of services uh, within the community where the arts and cultural sector would be linked with other uh, associations and, and uh, resources. Long story short, it only then took us nine years to get public sector funding for the arts. <laughs> but what we had established was trust. Trust in terms of the power to convene. And um, we had a couple of bites at the apple, which I can talk about later, uh, for public sector funding for the arts. It didn't quite work out, and there's some amazing stories around that. But ultimately, the community was able to come together. And today, if Cuyahoga County was a state in the union, a state in the union, in terms of real dollars, not per capita, but real dollars, if it was a state arts council in the state of Cuyahoga, it would be ranked third after New York and Minnesota. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> so I am going to talk to you about uh, kind of the practical application of some of what Stephen has talked about. And I really love your guiding coalition uh, energy field diagram um, and what you talked about, the power of conveners. And I have three of my um, local conveners right here in the audience. So, and I'm just gonna name them and embarrass them. So in the first row is Nolan Back, who is the uh, fourth year graphic design student here at Cleveland Institute of Art. Yay. Stand and in the third row is Bill Jean, who is a 
the former uh, drawing teacher and um, director of continuing education here at CIA and is the founder and kind of co-chair of City Artists at Work. Yay. And then someone who is not in the arts field but is in the field of serving people is Michael Searing, who is uh, there in the blue shirt. Um, so how these people all <laughs> um, So I'm going to tell you a little bit about how these people all tie together and um, how lucky, you'll see how lucky I am that I get to work with them. Because um, actually, secretly, I always wanted to be an artist, but I never had the confidence to go to art school. So this is kind of like living out my uh, my dream of being next to working with artists who have real <laughs> talents. So um, the, this is a this is a um, a photograph of a very early meeting that we held in the Superior Arts District, and I want to tell you where that is. Or actually, who here knows where the Superior Arts District is? Okay, so most of you. So it's between East 18th and goes all the way th to East 40th. Um, and it is the, in the northern section of the campus district, which is the eastern half of downtown Cleveland. So um, between East 18th and East 30th, from the shoreway, picture this, long and narrow, down to Orange Avenue. So within the campus district, we have um, a lot of lakefront industrial properties. Um, the Superior Arts District, uh, the CSU campus, the Tri-C campus, St. Vincent Charity, and a number of uh, lots of businesses and large nonprofits. So um, when I first came into the job of the campus district almost two years ago, um, I started meeting with people, and especially up north, I you know go out and meet with property owners, and and uh, people would say who's the campus district, what's, you know, they've never done anything for us. And then I'd hear a litany of all the problems, safety, um, homeless people urinating and pooping in their doorways and in their alleys, um, car break-ins, and I was just kind of overwhelmed, like, oh my gosh, what the heck am I going to do here? Um, and so because I, my background is community organizing, um, my inherent belief is that the answers lie in the community that is struggling with the issues that are present, um, as I know Mark believes in that. Um, and so we started with a community meeting, and this was, um, I don't know if any of you are into, um, how would you describe Derek's art? Dark, Dark art? <laughs> uh, Derek has, is on the left. Um, and uh, on the right are, pardon? oh right, yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, and then uh, on the right are uh, is the director of frontline services and um, uh, her assistant director, which is a homeless service agency. And so we had a meeting where people got paired together um, at tables. So um, because in the past there had been friction between um, agencies serving, not so much the agencies, but kind of the, that they represented the homeless population that um, property owners and businesses saw that these, you know, this is the source of our problems. And honestly, it is, it is a challenge because our prison system um, does not have adequate um, re-entry plans, and so people end up going to Lutheran Metropolitan Ministry at 2100 Lakeside, where Mike is the director, vice president of housing services. And so they are like the last stop. So um, they get lots of re-entry folks. And, and it's, very ch it's a challenging environment to work in because there are not only people who are going for services, but then there are people who are just constantly on the street and never go indoors. So um, we had the, the pairings of the agencies, the artists um, from the arts district, and we started talking about what are some of the solutions, and Derek actually, and I got to draw too, we, the artists drew out what some of the solutions were. And in some ways, that was like our early blueprint of this, these are the kinds of things that we need to work on. So safety, you know, is obviously one thing, and, and I don't have to talk to you about that. It's like, you know, police involvement and all of that. But then we started looking at what are the, um, uh, the physical designs of the neighborhood that could actually um, help support um, people living, coexisting um, without conflict. Next slide. And um, 
Mike, Michael Searing had um, been approached by the um, Bailey Davis, who is a Cleveland Institute of Art now alum, um, about doing a project for her senior thesis, and she wanted to do it uh, in a way that would serve the homeless population. And so Mike had been in meetings and you know knew that a public bathroom is really a, a, a solution that could solve some of the problems in, in this um, neighborhood that had so many homeless people. So Bailey came up with this awesome design, next slide, which was her senior um, thesis. And she actually created it, built a life-size model, and brought it to the, um, the what do you call it, when it's the, not the spring show, what is it? Spring, spring show. Yeah. And, um, and then we actually, Michael Searing at uh, Lutheran Metropolitan Ministry and uh, 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 the staff at Frontline brought uh, homeless clients to the um, MOCO where it was on display outside and, sh and did kind of like a real life focus group. Like, you know, would, how would you feel about, you know, using this bathroom and, and um, where should it be and those kinds of things. And so we, she got great feedback. And um, her initial designs, while we probably won't up, end up with that exact solution, um, her initial designs got, really gave us some energy and our committee is actually about 18 different entities um, working together, homeless agencies, um, the city of Cleveland, the county, um, and I'd like to say we're like close to building it, but our first step is actually doing some test locations with porta potties and um, enough about bathrooms. Anyway, so here is, here is like one example where um, uh, a very talented artist kind of was the um, uh, catalyst for getting us kind of energized um, to work on public bathrooms and to be thinking about that they don't have to be like really just ugly. So this is a design that Nolan did because we, as we started meeting, um, we felt like we need an identity, we need an, an, a name, and I don't know who came up with Superior Initiative. Maybe it was you, maybe it's, it's yeah. Um, but then Nolan created uh, uh, our little logo here, which basically is, you know, people in the background working together. Um, and we have our Facebook page, thanks to Nolan, and please friend us. Um, and so we, we then kind of started to gel and form this organization. Not, it's not an organization where you sign up, but you know there are uh, monthly meetings, and it's everyone from um, all of the populations that I shared. So it's artists, it's, um, uh, we hope soon, some CSU students, since they are moving into the, the neighborhood. Um, and we began looking at what are the other things that we could do. And um, one of the um, uh, kind of missing pieces along Superior is the identification that is, is an arts district. Um, so the, the street has had banners um, several times over the years, um, but uh, it had been some time since, several years since there were banners up. And, um, you know, usually um, a nonprofit community development organization would hire a designer and, you know, have a, kind of a you know, a, a little bit sterile process for designing the banners. And so it seemed to us that this was a great opportunity to bring some of the different um, segments of our community together. Next <coughs> slide. So, um, don't be embarrassed. So, so this is, um, these are uh, a couple of photos from a project that we just did September 27th in Bill Jean's studio on Superior, where um, Lutheran Metropolitan Ministry brought, brought over several um, men from the shelter who were willing to participate <coughs> and, who, and who worked with artists that Bill had um, uh, recruited and some, a couple of CSU students and they, next slide, yeah. And so they worked together and created um, these really beautiful uh, designs. And then Bill le led the most wonderful critique. He had them all up on the wall um, in the building. 
And it was as it, like every piece was taken seriously as if, you know, a real artist had done it, whether they had training or not. And through that process, you know, um, then they kind of um, uh, looked at how do we crop this and how do we turn this into a banner. And I hope, and then of course, Nolan, <coughs> um, with his great graphic design skills, um, he and Bill then looked at each of the uh, pieces of art, and every one of them is being used um, uh, for a banner. And so it's, it is a small thing, but yet it's like a first really <coughs> concrete step to say that we are working together, we're all in this together. Um, and the role that artists play is one of just seeing the world um, in a, just a more open kind of way. And so um, I don't know how to describe this uh, exactly, but I just, I loved how Bill presented um, the work in that there is no such thing as like a mistake. There's no such thing as imperfection. It's like we're all, um, we're all kind of our own artists. And so it was, it was really uh, fun for me to be part of that. And <clears throat> I feel like as we go forward, I love, I really am going to keep thinking about this uh, energy field that you designed. Because when I think about when I started, you know, two years ago and there was like um, that outward circle where it's, I don't know if you meant it this way, but the, the negative signs, it's like you're, there's not connection. And then as you move closer and build relationships, this is my interpretation of your, of your design, so that as you move closer together and build relationships, it becomes it, like the energy changes to really be positive and proactive, problem solving and empowering. So that's how I interpreted your, your design. Yeah, if, if I may, it, that's exactly the idea, but the negative charge on the outside, the critics, those who don't believe in it, the reactionary force to it, they're in a tug of war with you. Mm -hmm. And if you don't keep building that out, they're recruiting their, their critics as well. And so the real leadership issue is how do you keep opening that guiding coalition to build out and get enough positive energy to take it forward? And I've watched these others implode where the critics just got so strong that they destroyed that inner core. So you got it right. Thanks. So, and before you leave, I want everyone to come up and take one of these Nolan Beck designed <laughs> awesome uh, brochures because we have started a crowd rise campaign um, and we are raising money to um, install the banners. They're $200 each. So this is a shameless plug. Give us $10 and watch. And if you go to the crowd rise site, you can see the video. There's a four minute video um, that was created and the director of the video is here, Patty. Raise your hand. Um, anyway, so uh, the one last thing I want to talk about is the critical role that Kent State Urban Design um, Collaborative is playing in this in this neighborhood and in this project. And I was hesitant to bring it up because I mean it's another design school, different, but urban design. Um, but pardon me. Oh, I know they're here, um, <laughs> but I was trying to just like talk about the CIA. Anyway, um, <laughs> anyway, we have um, an amazing partnership with um, Kent State Urban Design Collaborative, and they actually got a uh, Cuyahoga Arts and Culture grant to be able to have uh, to work in the Superior Arts District um, with LMM with us on various projects um, and to really help design a neighborhood that works for everybody. So it's urban design and it's art. So, all right, I'm sorry, I'm way over my five minutes. Thank you, Bobby. I don't know if we've talked about this, Nolan, but we've already decided you're never graduating, by the way. <laughs> Keep you forever. <laughs> Mark, go ahead. And that was uh, very inspiring. And I, I want to I wanna talk about the role of art in these three forms of, of human, uh, three forms of capital, but I want to focus on social capital. But before I do that, uh, Steve, your notion of social profit agency made me remember that 
I was introduced by a friend one time at Bluffton College uh, in their um, annual um, com or con convocation, and I was talking about violence and hate, uh, work that I had done around those issues. And he uh, introduced me, because he knows my family, he knows all my family, large family, and they're all in business. He introduced me as a social justice entrepreneur. And I thought that really fit well. Um, and so I, I claimed that, and I've used that. But actually, uh, and I would encourage you to do this, what I'm going to say now, Bobby, as well, because I know you so well. For the last several years, I've actually began embracing myself as an artist. Um, and so uh, when I think about social practice and the role that art plays in social practice, I really think about my work as being an artist. Uh, because as an artist, uh, I, I think about designing spaces where people can come together. And um, as artists, I often see things uh, from an artist's mindset. I see things that maybe people take for granted all around them. Uh, and, or uh, I see things that people refuse to look at. Um, I, and I see possibilities. And I also see in the negative spaces what could be. And so I think that work uh, in community building is really a design work. Um, but, uh, but in terms of the role of art, I really think that art does several things in this arena of, of, of capital. Art connects us to ourselves, and I'll say a little bit about that. It connects us to others, and it connects us to the future. In terms of connecting it to ourselves, Wendell Bailey said, or Bear, Wendell Berry said, you don't know who you are until you know where you're from. And you got that really down well in terms of Portsmouth. And, uh, and so I think art has that ability to help us connect to our own story and where we come from and the roots of our story, which I think is really fundamental in doing the work. In terms of connecting us with each other, art has an amazing capacity, I think, to help break down uh, stereotypes and walls between people, which is a primary part of my work. And I think it does that because art connects us to story. It connects us to people's lives and their, their lived experiences in a way that preaching at people or, or telling them what to do will never work. And so an example of that that I would give of how people were connected together is actually a project I worked on a long time ago with Bobby in the Slavic Village neighborhood. We were working around a project we called Broadway Diversity and Progress. And that project was really about bringing African Americans and Polish Americans from that neighborhood together, who were frankly not seeing themselves as part of the same community, but as competing communities for the same space. I think one of the breakthroughs was that in that process was actually uh, hearing each other's stories, but it was when we created a mural together on Broadway that that process actually changed because we, we got an arts grant and we brought in a, an artist and she heard people's stories. And then she came back and said, I have a sketch and I'd like to share what I think this neighborhood is and, and the story of your neighborhood based on those, those interviews. It was a mixed group of people, young and old, white and black, and they looked at that and they engaged in this powerful dialogue. A dialogue that wasn't possible through doing prejudice reduction workshops or other kind of things. And it was a dialogue about what the nature of the community was. Well, there's too many black people in that picture. Well, then there was a comment, well, that's how many black people live here today. And so it was through that process and through various iterations of that mural that people came together and said, that's the community. And so I remember uh, the, the, and you can see the mural, I should have brought, uh, I have an image on my thumb drive. When the final sketch was done, there was, it was a, a parade and it has a big welcome banner. And Dan Kane, dear Dan Kane, mm -hmm. said, that's the neighborhood that I grew up in. And he saw the music and he said, that's just like Broadway when I was a kid. You'd walk down the street and there'd be music and there. But it was in multicolor. It was African Americans and whites together. So art had that transforming moment of people connecting together. And then the third way I think art really has an impact is it connects us to the future. And it see, it cre we create possibilities. The artists can do that, but we can do that as well uh, as, as social designers. So um, I hadn't told you this story yet, Steve, but uh, Steve and I have common background in working in El Salvador. So after the peace commission, or after the peace accords were formed, uh, were signed in El Salvador, I went down and I had done work during the war. And uh, we brought groups together from different sides of the war, uh, people who had 
uh, come from the same part of the country. Some had been living in internal exile. Some had uh, guerrillas had occupied their homes. And so they actually uh, were fighting for the same uh, future community. So in that process, the turning point of those three-day workshops at a retreat center was when we used Elise Boulding's work around, uh, peace building work around what their vision of the future was. And so their instructions were, you've had 15 years of civil war. Imagine 15 years of peace. What does your community look like? And giving them big sheets of paper and say, your instructions are to draw your community. And what, what, what constitutes that community? What are people doing? What are the, what are the, what's the infrastructure there? And we don't want you to use words. We want you to use images. And that really got people thinking. And we had these, again, people from both sides of the war creating a drawing of their village, of their community. And so they had to visualize what was safety. And so they put alternative structures that were not police stations. They were uh, um, nurturing uh, centers for community centers where safety was a component. But so it was that art that actually helped them visualize the future. So I think art has that capacity that is really an amazing thing. And then I just wanted to say uh, one more thing that I think is really important to recognize um, is that art moves us from victim to agent, uh, to change agent, as, as, as Steve talked about. And I think it has the capacity of actually creating us. And so when I go into communities where there's a lot of negativity and hopelessness, it's that artistic act that actually gets people alive and sees hope and sees the possibility in the future. And when that's done collectively, that art, it becomes community building and place making. So, so that's an important piece. And in terms of the, the three <coughs> spheres, I think we have to recognize that in many ways government has uh, neglected some of its responsibility to create the kind of conditions for that to happen. I think the nonprofits, the philanthropic community, has done an amazing amount of lifting. But there's a way in which that kind of community building ought to be fostered by our governments. I told the story, and I'll end on this, the other day, on, yesterday on the radio, that my son just came back from a tour. His band name, I didn't say it on the radio, I should have said it, is Signals Midwest, and they're doing a tour in, in Ohio now. Um, but they toured all over Europe, and he said, when they went to Germany, uh, they went to these alternative venues. And each community, small villages, there were these community centers that they could play at, and they had laws for them to sleep at. It was all paid for by the government. Mm -hmm. And we think about, and there are artist studios in these communities. <coughs> we think about violence and, and, and our concerns about young people in this country. What if we had these kind of creative outlets in every community? And I know Steve has examples from Medellin and other places where that's happened. I think our government needs to invest in our communities in that way, and I think the arts is a perfect example of that. So, thank you. Great. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> So we have a little time uh, for some questions, and if I may, I'd like to uh, start off with one. Uh, I mentioned earlier on that the academic initiative of uh, Cleveland Institute of Art for the last three years or so has been something we call Cores and Connections. Uh, the first part of that is the core of what we do as a really good art and design school. And the second part of that is about our ability to connect outward, and we're getting more and more interested in that internationally. Um, so I want, as a follow-up to this, this isn't a one-off to me. I'd like to reconvene uh, members of this group to get together again and figure out how to go forward uh, so that this isn't just a meeting we have and then we go back and do our own thing. So I want to ask, I guess, Steve, I'll start with you. Um, when we look at your concentric circles chart, that you and I talked about at some length yesterday, and we think about that inner, the nucleus, having the positive um, signs and forces then the middle ring is the positive, negative, people that aren't quite sure, maybe yes, maybe no. And then the outer ring, uh, some negative um, energy. Um, we can think about those things uh, along the lines of individuals and in trying to affect institutional change, and that's what we talked about, how to turn the ship here in a certain direction. But we could also think about this along organizational lines. So if you think of that same chart with various organizations, right? And this is what I'm interested in. I'm not interested in that binary thing anymore because we have enough of that. I'm interested in more the triangulation that you talked about, right? Or the, the rhizomatic network. So how do you affect that type of bringing into the center with organizations? So we're looking at it on a more macro as opposed to micro level. How do you, 
help me figure out how to do that. Well, I, I think you're doing exactly what you want, you're, you're trying to do, and I think it's, you listen, you convene, you bring people together in a thoughtful way. Um, intentionality, I think, is so important. Go, go back to the other, just, just that one and hold it. No, no, the other, the, the concentric circle. There, that one. And I think Stephen Covey got it right about the only way you get empowerment is through high trust culture building. And the other thing I think about that is um, where, wherever I've been in a situation where I can't build that out and the negative forces start building it down is because there's something I've decided to call emotional dishonesty. People just don't level with you. They're, they're playing games behind their back. You think they've bought in, but they haven't. I mean, Steve, you could see yeah. that on an organizational level look, as well. And, and look, you can do it in an organizational level. You can do it in a personal relationship. That works in a family. It works in a community. And what I've come out to find is that um, I do a lot of performance reviews in organizations. And I came to this simple conclusion. You can't perform and deliver in the negative state of criticism all the time. You, you have to have a positive, proactive, forward way mm -hmm. to deliver in these very difficult programs. And so in building high trust, you've got to be honest and clear. And so at this stage in my life, um, I'm much more blunt than I am. <laughs> but I'm also, I'm, I try to really engage about you know, we've been working on this together for a number of years and we're not going anywhere and there's just, no matter what problem we solve, there's another problem, so how can I get you to lead this thing? And I think the other thing is, um, the first thing that gets cut always are the formative training opportunities for leadership. And, you, you know, I love the um, entrepreneur and social justice um, and, one of the things that I find is that just the, the reconfiguring of language allows some people to reimagine themselves in different ways. And I had a young man I was working with in uh, Cleveland or, or in Detroit, and, and he was really trying a lot of things much like Tom has been doing. And, and, and he was trying to figure out a way to generate resources. And I said, you know, James, you really seem like a social entrepreneur to me. And he goes, what's that? So that's a contradiction in terms. Entrepreneurs are business and profit. I go, no, the entrepreneurial spirit is one looking to create profit, and it could be for a community. And so, Tom, I don't know how you came up with the idea of this tax and had the persistence to get it through, but what a brilliant idea. And the idea is, if you won't pay for this through some other means, well, tax of ice, you know. Great. There's a social entrepreneur working that. But I, I, I think it's just, it goes back to this issue of where and how do you build trust. And you find out very quickly whether you can do that or not. I think the fact that all of you are here today indicates a willingness to engage and learn about what is it we can do together. And, and again, I, I look at the talent at this table in Cleveland, and, and here's the other thing that happens. I was in Brazil two weeks ago, and I told everyone, I'm going to Cleveland. And I go, let's play keyword focus group. I'm going to say Cleveland, Ohio, and tell me what words you associate with it. All right? Now, so I took this into some of the classrooms, and they go, mistake on the lake, rust, the burning river. I go, no, no. LeBron James. I go, no. Do you know what every Latin American I raised had to say? Music. Cleveland Clinic. Cleveland Clinic. Was it the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? So I thought, I'm going to try this again. Chicago, Illinois. And they go, University of Chicago and the Institute of Art. I go, oh, you got two. But so when I was pulling in and I looked at all these bios and I go, they got students working in the Cleveland Institute? They got the active engagement of Case Western. They've got 
this incredible work that Tom and Bobby are doing, I hope that within 10 years when you hit the word Cleveland, you have this whole different frame of reference. And I think, God, I just can't say it this way, but I hope the people of Cleveland come to understand what you're trying to do in this room. And when they're asked, how would you label or brand Cleveland? It's something more powerful. When, when, and, and, and positive. Um, when I shared with that one class, we finally got our vision down to just three ideas, simply because I couldn't remember anymore. In fact, <laughs> serve, change lives. And I go, so what's the Cleveland Institute of Arts <clears throat> tagline? And they came up with and struggled with connect, empower, and inspire. And I go, would it be in that same order? Would it be inspire, connect, empower? And so I just left them working with it. But I think the way you explore these things is again what you're doing. You bring people together. You create a safe, positive place to explore this. And then here's the final piece of it. Be blatantly honest about what your interest and needs are. Wherever we have these long-term, sustainable partnership that keep generating change, it's because the need is satisfied by all parties. Okay? And where it gets tangled up and confused, it's like you were saying, well, your definition is different from my definition, and well, let's work through the definitions. This is who we are and what we stand for. If you're in agreement with that, let's move forward, okay? Um, I think the other final part of that is I found there's a real difference between a confidant and an ally. A allies can come and go depending on where you're going with resources or something, but confidants are the true holders of the mission, the shared mission. They believe in it. Some call them the spear throwers or the shield carriers, but they're, they really buy into that mission. They may compete, actually, on some things. Um, you, you mentioned Medellin. Medellin has gone from being the bloodbath capital of the world to a city transformed. Do you know what they figured out? We were disconnected. We had no social capital. We couldn't even get together because the roadways were so bad. Isolated communities didn't feel park. There was no education. So they go, transportation, education. Tr overhead air trams, mass transportation, trains into everything they could, and at every off spot and arrival spot was either a art museum a cultural institute, or a library. You couldn't avoid them. And you know what else happens? People go, we're valued. When you give someone the access to art, you're valued. And here's the other thing I found in Juarez, Mexico. We had one kid who was a gangbanger. He killed people. and he, We gave him an opportunity to get out of there and try to retrain himself. And he came in and, and um, one of the things we do is we put them through a service project of cleaning up a school or an area. And here was his comment about how he changed his life. He goes, no one ever thought I could contribute. They saw no value in me. But when you give someone the opportunity to create something, you dignify them in a way that no other act does. Sorry, I didn't mean to get off of it. Thank you, Steve. A uh, few uh, remaining minutes. Questions from the from the audience for the panel? Please. Uh, I'm Neil Hodges. I manage. I work for the social property agency. Um, I manage the social initiative that looks at the surrounding communities that make up university circles. So we go there and tell the people to do this. I release disparity. Of anybody. 
coming. Well, let me say just one thing about that, um, because uh, we've been looking at that in the work we've been doing in East Cleveland, and uh, I think, fortunately, we've been working with MICOM and uh, Cleveland Foundation and NLI at looking at a more positive approach to youth development rather than trying to just get kids off the street or keep them, keeping them in a curfew or kind of a lockdown mentality. We've really taken a much more positive approach, which is the center there, right, and how do we create opportunities for youth development there. And Belinda Kyle is here from the city of East Cleveland and she's a very positive champion and she will tell you that the greatest need is for the arts. And so that's actually what we're trying to create is opportunities for arts. And, uh, and one of the things that Belinda talks a lot about and I think it's very interesting in terms of the positivity is that we need to create places of beauty in communities like East Cleveland so that because what does it say, you know, you talked about what value does it have? What value does it have to look at vacancy and, and, and deprivation? How can we look at places of beauty and so that young people say, I'm part of this community and it's a beautiful community. So, did I do okay, Belinda? Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Other comments or questions, anyone? Fr Franny? Thank you, Franny. Any uh, other comments, questions, anyone? Where do we go from here? Anybody on the road? Another dialogue? Well, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, we should definitely follow up on this. I know uh, we have a lot of, like I said earlier, I have a lot of, I know Marty Cohen and the Medical Humanities and Megan at MOCA and a lot of one-on-one -on -one connections we have at the school, but I want to figure out how we can do more of that triangulation that, that we, you and I have been talking about a lot, Steve. I'm really interested in that now. Yeah, and, and I think the, the other thing is the place you really want to go is this gentleman right here, his invitation. But, but the, the thing that always admire, you know, uh, intrigues me is who gets at the table. And, and Tom, your early description of it's always the same faces. And so, how do you find someone new that convenes a new set of players that, that really have something to offer? And so you, you, I think you should always be scanning that horizon for people who, who carry the message right, but no one's listening to them. And I think the other part of this, it's the things that, you know, the, the definition of a cynic is someone who knows the cost of everything but the value of nothing. And, and so what I, I keep finding is that artists are just undervalued in artist institutes and the sourcing of artists just are not valued. And what I keep finding, saying is, my God, without them, I, nothing would have worked over the past 40 years for me. I, I was not trained as an artist. Um, and so I came to this late, but you can't avoid the, um, 
The, the other piece of it, too, I think really comes down to it. Um, I was sharing with one of the classes, there's a, a wonderful book for potters called Centering. It used to be sort of the <laughs> underground Bible of artisans. And